let me introduce you to uh, Gergo Erdi, which goes by the same name on Twitter. Uh, Gergo has added uh, pattern synonyms to the GHC compiler. He also used SMT solvers to analyze all text adventure games and used Rust to program AVR microcontrollers. You can learn more on these topics on his blog slash website and safeperform.io. Lately, he has turned to Clash, the Haskell to FPGA compiler, of which he will talk in this session. Gergo. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Gergo Erdi, and uh, I will be talking about FPGA development with Haskell. And if you don't know what an FPGA is, don't worry about it, because we're going to go into that uh, in a bit. So the title of my talk is Executable, Synthesizable, and Human Readable Pick 3, which is obviously a play on you know, classic trilemmas like the CAP theorem or the you know, uh, uh, cheap, quick, or good quality Pick 2. So what I'm claiming is that with, with Clash, there is no compromise. You can write hardware, you can design hardware, in such a way that it is not horrible to read and it actually does what it's supposed to in the sense that it will turn into hardware at the end, but also uh, you will be able to run it as software, the, the same definitions. So that's a lot to unpack. So let's get to it. So the running example in this talk, and, and in fact, the only example that we're, look, we're going to look at is a solitaire version of Pong. So those of you in the audience who are maybe too young to have ever seen Pong. So Pong is like a very simplistic simulation of, of tennis. I guess the solitaire version would be a simplistic simulation of squash. So you have on your screen, you have three walls and you have a ball that's bouncing around these three walls. And then the fourth wall, you have a pedal and you're controlling the pedal and you know you want to keep hitting the ball back so that it will not go off on the right hand side of the screen outside the, the play area. So this is the game that we are going to be implementing. And first we're going to look at this as a Haskell software implementation. So basically the first part of my talk, it aims not to show you anything new. In fact, the whole point of the first half is going to be that everything we do is idiomatic Haskell. It should be stuff that uh, you would write yourself if you're doing this as just a game that runs on a computer, because the real value is going to be in the fact that we can then take what he, we have written for that implementation and turn that into hardware. So if you find the first part boring, that's good. That means it, it is what I intended it to be. I mean, how would we do this, right? We, we, in normal Haskell, we would start by modeling the game state as some data type, which would come with some initializer. And then in every frame, we would update the game state by taking the user input and the current state and computing the new state. So what is the state of Pong. Well, in, in the version that we will be looking at, we will say that the coordinates of the ball are decomposed into horizontal and the vertical component. And for each of these components, we have both a position and a speed. Now, this is maybe not how you would write it if you're doing it in software, because the other obvious decomposition is to say that the ball has a 2D position and it has a 2D velocity or speed. Uh, but, and, and that would mean that, you know, we, we have the position as one field and the speed as the other field. Whereas here we say that everything that is about the ball's horizontal behavior, so the position and the horizontal component of the speed is in one field. And then everything about the vertical uh, state of the ball is in another field. So the reason that it is factored this way is just because it will make it simpler to implement the bouncing around because you know the, all the walls that we will bounce off 
and the pedal that we will also want to bounce off. All of these things are uh, axis aligned. So the vertical, ball, uh, vertical wall is only going to bounce the ball horizontally. The, vertical, uh, the horizontal wall is only going to bounce the ball vertically. So we will get a simpler implementation if we think ahead just a bit and factor it like this. So the other component of the state is going to be where the pedal is. So that's the thing that the user has control or the player has control over. So you know you can move that up or down. And we also need to know whether we are in whether the ball has just gone out. So basically, we will set the game over uh, flag to true if we want to show to the user that he just lost the ball. One interesting thing that we might see here is that the, the ball and the pedal coordinates are stored in a data type called signed 10. What that means is that it's a signed 10 bit value. This is a type that is that comes from the clash standard library. But uh, for us, all we need to know is that it's a 10 bit sign number. The reason that we are using it here instead of let's say integer is because you know, if eventually we want to build hardware from it, then we want to be precise about the size of things. So integer would be right uh, out of question because that doesn't have a fixed size. We could use int, but we don't need you know, like a 64-bit value uh, to just represent the ball's position and speed because we are going to go for, like, like I showed in the original you know, screenshot, we're going for this retro aesthetic. So the resolution is only going to be a couple hundred in each direction. And the reason that we are using a signed representation is again, because it makes it easier to implement the bouncing calculation. So we have this, this data type and you know, we derive uh, lenses for it just because that will make things easier later on. So this is again, perfectly normal. Haskell code. So then to initialize the state, well, we just decide on a starting position and the starting speed of the ball. So as you can see, in this case, we say that the ball starts at position 10 comma 100 with the horizontal speed of two and the vertical speed of three. We put the pedal again, just somewhere. And so the, the play field is, if, if the play field is like 256 by 200, then yeah, the pedal would start in the middle or rather the top of the pedal would start in the middle because you know, we also have to decide what, what is it that we represent as pedal y. It could be the middle of the pedal, it could be the top of the pedal and so on. And of course, when we start the game, it's not over yet. That would be quite cruel to, to start the game with it already being over. So then we get to update state and to, to implement update state, we need some representation of the inputs. So here, let's just say that we have two buttons that control the pedal. One of them moves it up, one of them moves it down. Now, of course you might ask, uh, okay, well, the pedal can't possibly move up and down at the same time. So why not have a data type, which basically says the direction of movement instead of two separate bulls for either moving up or moving down. So the reason for that is because at this level, we are interested in the row input. Yeah, you know, there's nothing holding me back from pressing two buttons at the same time. The game might not make much sense of it, but physically it is of course possible to press two buttons, like or two keys. Like if you imagine this running on a computer and you, you assign two keys on the keyboard to pedal up and pedal down, then of course you can press both of them. So any decision about that will go into update state. And then to actually implement update state, well, you can use a state monad, right? Because ultimately it's, it has some parameter inputs, but then it's a state to state function. And to make it easier to compose smaller state update functions, we can just use exact state. And then, so what is it that we need to do in update state? Well, we need to update the ball position. So that includes moving the ball according to its current speed, moving the ball if it has moved beyond 
a wall. So you can basically implement bouncing by fixing the position if it has moved to the wrong side of a wall. And of course, in that case, we also negate the speed in that direction. Then we update the pedal based on the user's input. So basically, if up is held, we will change the pedal position to be slightly higher. If down is held, we move it down. And then we check if the ball is still in the court, because if it's out of bounds, that means the user has just lost. So in that case, you know, we can make a new state that corresponds to like resetting the ball in some sense. And we set the uh, game over flag to true so that we can flash the, so what the way we will show that is by flashing the background of the play field in, in red. Okay, so, so let's look at a bit more detail on these. So one thing, uh, so how do we update the ball? Well, because we have decomposed the state into vertical and horizontal direction, uh, we can update the ball by updating it vertically and horizontally. Uh, but the thing is that if we did it just this way, this would be a bit boring because what that means is that the behavior of the ball is completely fixed. It, it doesn't really depend on what the user does. All, all the user needs to do is put the pedal where it needs to be and then the ball will just do its thing. So we can improve it a bit by passing the inputs to update ball and then say that if during the horizontal update, we recognized that the ball has hit the pedal, then we can nudge the ball according to the current speed of the pedal. So basically what, what, what you can see here is that the vertical speed is nudged by a certain amount, either in the positive or in the negative direction, depending on which way the pedal was moving. So basically it allows you to give it a bit of a, but you know, it, it's, not exactly, it's not exactly giving it a spin. We're not modeling physics like that to that resolution here. It really is just giving it a bit of a vertical nudge as you bounce it back horizontally. And we will see in, in, in a video what exactly that looks like later on. Now that we know how we model and how we handle the changes to the state, it's also, the other thing we need to do is to actually render it on the screen. And again, we go for a very simple solution here, which is to have a function that takes the state, takes the X and Y coordinates and gives us the color of that particular point. So this, the size of the screen is chosen to be 256 by 200 uh, for two reasons. One is to, like I said, to emulate that, you know, like the chunky retro look with, with big pixels. And also because 256 is of course a round number. Uh, 200 is a humanly round number. And it also makes it clear that it's a bit awkward to use if we were uh, restricted to only specifying bit widths. So the screen height is intentionally chosen to be not so simple to work with because it allows us to show off the index data type of flash, which differs from what we saw with the signed and unsigned in that instead of giving the bit width, we actually give the full range. So, so the Y type can only go between zero and 199 and the width can only go from zero to 255. And then to do the actual drawing, we just compute the red, green and blue components of the given pixel. And how do we do that? Well, I mean, I haven't shown the details here, but hopefully you can imagine how you would do that. So if you, if you know the state, and you know the X and Y coordinates, to see if X and Y corresponds to a wall, you just need to compare that either, you know, X is less than the width of the left side vertical wall, or Y is less than the height of the top horizontal wall, or Y is larger than 200 minus the height of the, the bottom horizontal wall. And the same for, the pedal, you know, we just compare it with the pedal's current position. The same for the ball. Now, of course, the, the pedal and the ball, you know, they are represented by 
a single uh, coordinate pair, but when we are doing the drawing, we are going to decide on some size, but that we already need to do to implement the bouncing, right? So to, to compute the collision between the ball and the pedal, we already need to know how large the pedal is. Okay, so, so far so good, right? So what we have here is Haskell code. And this is normal Haskell code and it's fairly nice in the sense that it's idiomatic Haskell. So what can we do with Haskell code? Well, we can run it, right? So we can switch to, uh, we, we, we can add an SDN to, a uh, shell around it. And we say, okay, given a main window and given access to the current key states, we can look at the key state of the up arrow and the down arrow on the keyboard and feed that into update state. And then, you know, we call this draw function on the state. So this is all running in a state monad, as you can see. In fact, it's running in state DIO because SDR itself is running in IO. And then, given a function from X to Y to color, we can rasterize that by just calling it with every X, Y coordinate pair and, and drawing it on the screen. So, so it's something we can run. It really is software. It's a program. We can run it and it will look like this. I, I'm not even sure if you can see it uh, over my slides, but it looks like it's a bit awkward because the resolution is so small that on you know, current day screens, it's not really going to show up. But that's okay because one of the parameters we used in the thin SDL shell is this video params record type. And one of the fields sets the screen scaling factor, which is set to one here. An FPGA is a collection of logic gates and registers where the connections are electronically configurable. So basically you can upload your own design into it instead of having to fabricate a real physical chip. So it's like having a chip fab on your desk. And then uh, you know, around the chip, you have all kinds of, of uh, ports with which you can connect peripherals. And the problem with FPGAs is that the tool chains are horrible. So Verilog and VHDL are the two uh, hardware description languages that you use to configure your FPGA. But these are not nice languages if you look at them from a Haskell programmer's point of view. So these are, mm, these, these are languages that were designed by electrical engineers, right? And then instead we want to use Haskell instead of Verilog and VHDL. So how do we do that? So this is where Clash comes into play. So the, in, in Clash, uh, the basic primitives is that we have a type constructor called Signal which is an application functor. And the domain here stands for the clock domain. It doesn't really, it's not really important for us here. Uh, all we need to know about it is that it basically records the, at uh, the type level records the, the clock rate that we are working in. And so for any given clock rate, signal DOM is an applicative functor. Uh, and also we have a primitive called register which takes an initial value and the signal that corresponds to the update value and gives us a new signal, which will be the value of the register such that it starts at the initial value. And in each uh, clock cycle, it will update based on the, the second parameter. So using this, uh, we can describe circuits at the so-called register transfer level, which is what you see here a, a diagram of. So, so what we see here, is that we have a register and the, uh, and, and the current value of the register and some external input X together is fed into a function. So that corresponds to circuit which implements the given function, but it doesn't have any state. So that's a purely combinational circuit. We feed it the current value and some inputs and whatever comes out of it will be written into the register when the clock ticks. So this is a synchronous model and it's a model where we can compose these diagrams because basically the Y that comes out of this diagram could be the X that goes into another diagram. So basically everything you need to build hardware is on this slide. Now yeah, with a couple of asterisks, but, but for, for, for us here, all of this is going to be enough. So the other thing we need to know to build hardware is how are we going to actually produce video output? 
And so the way we're going to do this is by uh, generating VGA signals. So VGA is an old analog video standard. The details are not really important for us here. It basically corresponds to scanning the screen left to right, top to bottom, and we just produce the right color at the right time. That I don't think we need to go into any more details. And then we can write a reusable VGA signal generator, which says that, OK, given a, uh, so, so what is the VGA driver? VGA driver is something that gives you the sync signals that you need to connect to a monitor so that it knows you know, when to start a new line. And it will give you the X and Y coordinate that you are currently supposed to be drawing. And given this information, if you can then compute the color for the x and y coordinate, then you can feed the sync signals and the color signal onto a VGA connector and plug that into a screen, and then you will get a picture. So a VGA driver is basically something that takes the description of a given VGA mode. So for example, if you want to produce 640 by 480 VGA video, then we, we have to write a, the timing specification for 640 by 480, which includes a pixel clock definition of 25 megahertz. And then there's a bunch of numbers that you basically need to look up in a database of VGA modes. Okay, so basically you, know, you go on the internet, you, you, you search for it in the in documentation and you find that, okay, so the, the signal, the, the sync signal has to behave a certain way and you, put that information into a VGA timings value, you parameterize VGA driver with this information and you get the sync signal and you get the coordinate signals out of it. So then the, the Pong circuit will basically look like this. So we, have, we start with the VGA signal generator, the sync lines that come out of it are directly uh, connected to the outside world. The X and Y coordinates we transform. So we have uh, center and scale. These are uh, stateful coordinate transformations, which ensure that instead of seeing 640 X coordinates, we see 256. And instead of seeing 480 Y coordinates, we see 200. And scale means that we will see the same X coordinate multiple times. So that basically means that we are stretching the pixel sizes. And because two times 256 is still just 512 and we need to produce 640 pixels, center translates the coordinates so that you know, we have the same amount of border on both sides and the same vertically. And then uh, when the Y coordinate becomes nothing, which corresponds to you know, leaving the visible area and getting to the part where we're getting ready to start the new frame. So when, we, when the Y coordinate becomes nothing, that is when the frame ends. Then we update a register that holds the game state. So the way to do that is that we take the update state function that we have already written. We're not changing it, right? We have already written it for the software version. And we can take that wholesale, feed it as input the state of the two buttons, and feed it as input the current value of the state register. And whatever comes out of it, when it's the end of the frame, we allow that to replace the current value. So this is a hardware circuit, right? So you can't, you're always, you're always doing something. So basically what happens here is that we are always computing update state because we're not really computing it, right? It's just a circuit that signals flow through, but we only allow it to change the state when it is the end of the frame. So what does this look like when we actually write this in Clash code? Well, first we have some boilerplate to get through. So we define a 25 megahertz clock. And then we say that the circuit itself, you know, viewed from the outside has four input signals, you know, the clock, uh, the reset, which will, which can be a button, it can be something that comes from some some clock generator, and it has the two buttons as input signals, and the out, and it has one output, which is the VGA signal, which internally, of course, is not a single 
line, it's, it's made up of multiple lines because we have these horizontal and vertical sync lines and we have the red, green and blue channels and each of these three color channels is eight bits each, but it's abstracted into a VGA out type. And then in the actual implementation of it, we make a VGA driver for 640 by 480. We say that the frame ends when the Y coordinate stops being a just value. So it's falling is something that takes a Boolean signal. Uh, well, it can't take any other signal that has an ordering, but in our case, it takes a Boolean signal. And if the Boolean signal goes from true to false, then it is true. If it keeps being false or it keeps being true, then frame and is false. So frame and becomes true for the single cycle where y, VGA y becomes nothing. And then the inputs are made by applying the make inputs constructor, which is the same constructor we wrote initially for the software version. That's the beauty of this. Like this, this, this really like the, the three or the, the four bold words on this slide. That's basically what I'm trying to sell you here that we use the same algebraic data type for the inputs. We just lift it to the world of signals. We use the same state type with the same initializer and the same updater function is just lifted into the world of signals. So reg n here is a version of register that only updates whenever the frame and signal is true. So that's how we make sure that the, the state is only, the game state is updated once per frame. And then to draw, again, we use the same draw function. So this with border stuff around it is only to take care of the non, like, like the parts of the screen that are physically visible, but outside the scaled up 256 by 200 game fields, right? With what we have here is the full circuit. And we want to see it working the same way that we saw the software version working. So normally what you would do in FPGA development is that you would basically have some batch simulator. So you write something that generates some input and then you feed it to a simulation of the circuit and then you get out of it the output and then you analyze that. But come on, that's not fun, right? That's not why we're here, we're here to have fun. So we, instead we can do an interactive simulation. So the key to this is that Clash provides a function called signal automaton, which gives us a way of simulating one clock tick, getting the result, doing whatever we want with it, including doing IO with it. And then as the result of that, we can get a new value for the inputs to the circuit to feed in, and then we can keep turning the crank. So here, what we see is that I wrote a VGA signal interpreter. So that's something that takes the output of the circuit that, go, that is connected to the VGA connector and interprets it into a, an image. And important to notice here is that, of course, now the full window is not just the game field. The full window is 640 by 480 because, of course, the structure that parts of the screen are not really part of the game is lost at this point. We really are looking at the VGA signal as it comes out of the circuit. So the problem with this is that uh, if you use Clash directly for the simulation, the performance is quite bad. So I get around one third frames per second if I use Clash for this. But luckily, uh, simulating hardware description languages is a quite mature field, right? That, that there's lots of industrial use for that. So there are tools like Verilator, which is an open source Verilog simulator. And because the way Clash works is that ultimately it emits VHDL or Verilator so that you can feed it into the FPGA vendor tools, we can yeah. compile Clash into Verilog, pass it to Verilator for more efficient simulation, and then with a thin FFI layer between the two, we can run the very later simulation and feed it into the same VGA interpreter that we have written in Haskell. And all this is, can be automated. So, so if you look at my GitHub, there's a project called Clashilator, which automates the FFI from Clash to very, very later. So that you just write your normal Clash circuit, 
and it just replaces the simulation with a very later base simulation. And you get the exact same result, of course, because it's the same VGA interpreter. So if you look at the, the two screenshots, you know, here and here, uh, it is the same thing, except the ball is slightly different, a different position. So the reason for this is that because the first one runs at third FPS, I got bored waiting for the ball to move as much. That's why in the very later uh, screenshot, the ball has already moved more. And uh, at six FPS doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually borderline playable. So if you really just want to try out, if you want to see that it does what it's supposed to, to do, you can do it here. And you know, you can you can uh, debug it by looking at the behavior of the circuit instead of doing a uh, batch uh, simulation. So then if you want to actually run it on the real hardware, so the way that works is that you, you, you run Clash to compile your Clash program into Verilog, and then you feed it to whatever vendor tools come with your FPGA, and then you turn it into FPGA bitstream, and then you upload that again using vendor tools. Uh, so there's a package Clash Shake, which has turnkey support for some FPGA boards. These are basically the FPGA boards that I have. So that's the, that's the reason that these are supported. So we have support for uh, a bunch of Xilinx boards. And recently, uh, Dylan Thins stepped up to add support for an Intel FPGA uh, development board, the Aero Deca. It's work in progress, uh, but basically, hopefully in a couple of days time, Clash Shake will have support for the Aero Deca. And of course, if you have a different FPGA development board, but it's one of like the FPGA that is on it is similar to these, or, or you know, if, it, if it's supported by the same tool chain, then it's very easy to adapt the build system to it. So, you know, the build system is not really for the Papilio one, the build system is for anything that uses the Xilinx ISE tool chain. And same for the Nexus A7. It's not for that. It's for anything that uses Vivado. And the Arrow one is not for the Arrow Deca. It's for anything that uses Quartus. And maybe your development board could be next. So if, if, if this talk manages to convince you that playing around with FPGAs can be a lot of fun for a Haskell programmer, and you go out and, and get some FPGA development board, I would be more than happy to integrate uh, your work on automating the build into Clash Shake. And so now uh, let me just show you real quick what this looks like in practice. I guess I'll post, I'll upload the video somewhere and post a link to it. I mean, basically what you see on it is I press a bunch of buttons and then pong. So yeah. Uh, okay, and then uh, if this, you know, normally if this was an academic conference, then this would be the part where I say, okay, for further details, read our paper. But instead here, I can, what I can say is for more detail, read my book. So I have a book coming out shortly, which is not done yet, but it's very near completion, uh, which basically describes this at much more detail, this Haskell-based approach to hardware design. So it's not just about, you know, the fact that we can use Clash, but how can we write hardware in a very Haskell-ish way. And, and it's, uh, the way it's done is that in the book, we build a bunch of retro computing devices. For example, of course we build Pong, but we also build a full Intel 8080 processor. And then we use that processor to build Space Invaders. And then we finish with a full home computer. So what I want to say with this is that although Pong is a very simple, a very small circuit, this approach of Haskell first hardware development uh, so far seems to scale high enough that you can build a full computer, including the CPU with it. And uh, I think that's basically it. And I think I, I, I'm good in time as well. So we should have plenty of time left for, for questions. And yeah, if you want to check out uh, further details, uh, visit this website where you have links to all the GitHub repos to you know, Pong, Clash Shake, Clashulator, and everything else. So uh, thank you for your attention. And I guess we switch over to Q&A now. Yes, and we have uh, one first question, which is, um, do we have the demo code on GitHub? Uh, you mean what demo code, the Pong? 
Uh, or, yes. Well, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So, so Pong is on Git. Yeah, so the whole thing is on GitHub. The so the the for example, the, the VGA signal generator is written as a reusable library. So, so it's not baked into Pong, obviously. That's in a different repo, but also on, on GitHub. Flashulator itself is a separate repo. The, the simulator, uh, yeah, like the part of the simulator that implements the interpretation of VGA signal into an SDL uh, output is on GitHub. So yeah, everything is on GitHub, sure. Okay, we have um, an enthusiastic uh, reaction from Sasha, which says that um, this is really cool. Yeah, I agree. So that, that's why I started writing the book because I started playing around with this and I realized that, holy crap, this is, this is so nice way to, to make hardware. Yeah, and uh, we do have a question from Christian, which would like to know if you could still show the video. So, so you want me to try to show the video again, is what you're saying? Yeah, let's try it. Or, okay, sure. And so it changes its output to 40 band. And so if I start pressing the buttons, we will see the pedal move up and down. And if the ball hits the pedal just as I'm moving the pedal, you see that the, the vertical speed changed. So it got a here, right? It, it got a bit of vertical nudge because it. Uh, hit the button, uh, sorry, hit the ball just as I was moving the pedal. Okay. Yes, uh, we, we do have a bit of um, of um, static during the, the first mm. part of the video, but uh, uh, I believe most of it was, uh, was understandable. And we, we did get, yes, we did get the, the three FPS uh, from Clash during the video for your song. <laughs> but so people have seen the, the video and the, the demonstration. The, this was not simulation, right? So this was not the one third FPS simulation. This really was running on real hardware. So if you look at the full video, it's running at 60 FPS. Of course, it couldn't possibly run at front rate because the VGA mode that it produces, uh, the timing of it is defined such that it is at 60 FPS. And it was just a joke that, that uh, the user called Digital Brains wrote, but I just wanted to you know, clear, clear that up, that, that the video came not from the simulation, but from real hardware. The question is, how good is the generated FPGA code compared to native handwritten code for the same purpose? So I guess you mean good as in like resource utilization, uh, the, the real answer is that I haven't really cared about it. So if, if, if you look at the projects that I listed on the last slide, they're all uh, very old computers. And one of the reasons for that is because there's so much headroom on a modern FPGA that it doesn't really matter much if uh, you're not optimized fully in terms of, of resource utilization. But Clash itself has a fairly straightforward uh, model of how the Haskell code maps to hardware. So it's not supposed to give you any big surprises, uh, except for one thing. So maybe, maybe, I, I don't know if we have enough time, but I, I have a fun story about that. So there was one occasion where basically some locally bound uh, definition that I had was uh, accidentally too polymorphic in its usage of the num instance. And what that led to is that I, so I had this triplet of the red, green, and blue output channels. This was on the Space Invaders game, just for historical accuracy. And because of the polymorphism, so this was basically the same problem that the Monomorphism restriction is supposed to solve for top level uh, definitions, right? But this was a wear bound definition. And because of the polymorphism, the sharing was not kept. And what that meant is that I accidentally created a Space Invaders machine that was actually three different Space Invaders machines, each one only computing one color channel. So it, it was as if you had three computers next to each other and the first computer is only outputting red, the second computer is doing the exact same thing, but it's outputting green and the third one is outputting blue. And that is something that 
uh, you couldn't really see unless you looked at the generated uh, VHDL or Verilog uh, because you know the, the Haskell code that I wrote really kind of meant that it had no good reason to keep this sharing because you know, it was a, a, trip, a three tuple where different coordinates could use different num instances. So, so that's I, yeah yeah. So it's a fun stuff like that can can happen, but uh, in terms of how far the generated HDL is from 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 the Haskell code, like I said, if you actually read the the Clash uh, documentation or if you read uh, Christian's thesis on 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 the fundamentals of Clash, uh, there is a fairly straightforward mapping between the Haskell code and the generated HDL. So I guess the, the answer to Nomata's question is that uh, I don't know how good it is because I'm not an FPGA expert, but if you are, then it's not that hard to build a mental model so that you could answer this question.